Good evening, I'm Richard Kluche, co-host of The News on 680 CJOB and senior reporter at Global News. I'm excited, thrilled. This is fabulous to MC University of Manitoba's ninth annual, that's, that's, that's ninth annual three-minute thesis competition. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight for the three-minute thesis or 3MT as it's known. This is an annual competition where graduate students from across the university compete in front of an audience and a panel of judges to explain their research in plain language to a really non-specialist audience. I like to call it the elevator pitch. I know this event was held virtually last year as well. And I'm sure most of us didn't expect to be here a year later watching the competition online again, but here we are. And we are looking forward to a great event. As a graduate of the University of Manitoba, it's always a pleasure to be part of important events happening at my alma mater. Tonight's event is the culmination of months of hard work by our 12 student finalists. They have put so much time, so much effort into preparing engaging pre presentations. This competition is going to be fast paced, it's going to be excited, and I for one, I'm absolutely ready to get it started. I'd like to now invite Dr. Michael Benarash, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Manitoba to open the event. Thank you for the introduction. It's my pleasure to participate in this important competition. Before we go any further, we acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'd like to welcome everyone watching online to the finals for the three-minute thesis competition here at the University of Manitoba. One of the most challenging things a researcher can do is to communicate effectively to someone outside their field of expertise. Imagine having to condense months of literature searches, results of experiments and detailed analysis into just three minutes and make it meaningful. Communicating complex ideas can be difficult, but it is one of the most important aspects of research. Just think of how U of M graduates, Drs. Brent Rusin and Joss Reimer, or Lynette Siragusa communicate. They regularly convey crucial details of COVID-19 research and health directives in a way that is clear and concise. To our students competing here today, you are developing these crucial skills that will serve you well in your careers going forward. I congratulate and thank each and every one of you for having the passion and believe in your work to make it here today. You have all put a great deal of time and effort into this competition, even rising to the additional test of presenting virtually. Our judges have a very difficult task ahead of them, and I thank them for taking on the challenge of selecting tonight's winners. Thank you also to the 3MT Organizing Committee, led by Dr. Kelly Main, Acting Dean of Graduate Studies. I now welcome Dr. Main to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Benarash. As Acting Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, I'm delighted to be here to welcome you to the University of Manitoba's ninth annual three-minute thesis competition. The 3MT competition provides graduate students with a unique opportunity to condense their research into three minutes. By doing so, they are able to hone their communication skills and share their research with a broader audience, as we will see tonight. For those who are not familiar with this event, 3MT is an academic competition for graduate students developed by the University of Queensland in Australia. The success of the model has led to the establishment of competitions in several countries, as well as a French version called MT180, or Mathes en 180 secondes, which finished last week on April 15, 2021. 
The University of Manitoba participates in 3MT to highlight our graduate students, promote U of M research, and connect with the community. I am in the unique position to see and promote the work that our graduate students do on a daily basis. I am thrilled we are able to share with you tonight just some of the work that our more than 3,500 students are doing. This year's 3MT competition at the University of Manitoba began earlier this year. 43 individuals were selected from an initial pool of talented masters and doctoral students from 32 different departments who then competed in one of three heats. All of the challengers from each heat should be proud of the presentations they gave and their ability to communicate their research and engage the virtual audience and judges. That process determined the 12 finalists who compete tonight for the People's Choice Award, third place, the U of M Retirees Association Prize for second place, and the Dr. Archie McNichol Prize for first place. The graduate student who takes home first place tonight will move on to represent the University of Manitoba at the Western Canada Regional Competition and have the chance to have their presentation featured in a showcase of 3MT videos from graduate students across Canada. Graduate students are an integral part of the university's research program. By sharing their findings with you, we hope you will come away with a greater understanding of the value of their work and how their research contributions will lead to advancements that will improve our lives in the future. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Drs. Benarash and Dr. Main. Well, if you'd like to learn more about these amazing students behind the presentations you're about to watch, I invite you to read the event program, which contains their biographies, as well as the biographies of the judges who are here with us tonight, and a listing of all the challengers, challengers who competed in the heats. You can find that at umanitoba.ca forward slash 3MT. Now, on to the competition. Each of our challengers is allowed one slide to support their presentation. Their presentation must be three minutes or less, not a second longer, or they will be disqualified. Now, while presenting, they'll be timed and have a monitor facing them with a countdown clock so they know how much time they have left. While each challenger presents, the judges will be making notes. You're welcome to do the same to help you choose your favorite for the People's Choice Award, which you will be voting on during the break. Now, following the presentations, our judges will head off to a private breakout room to tally up the votes. Now, while that takes place, we will bring up the link on the screen for you to cast your vote at menti.com, capital M-E-N-T-I dot com. It's a free platform, and that will give you instructions on how to use it uh, after the students have presented. You will have seven minutes to cast your votes. Now. Uh, before we get to the competitors here, let's introduce our esteemed judges for the event. Raj Patel is chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. Also with this is Tracy McConaughey. She's the Deputy Minister, Economic Development and Jobs. Hey, Tracy. Hi there. And Doug Collier is with us, an early stage investor. He's a global executive as well as a member of the University of Manitoba's Alumni Council. Hey. Great to have the three of you um, judging. It's not going to be easy. Thank you really sincerely for making the time to be with us tonight and good luck choosing your favorites. You indeed have a tough job ahead of you. Now, for those who want to join the online conversation, tweeting is encouraged and the event hashtags are uh, 3MT, hashtag 3MT, hashtag U Manitoba, and hashtag capital UM Research. Now, on with the competition. Finalist is Cameron Ekout. His thesis title is Can Flaxseed Protect the Hearts of Women with Breast Cancer? What if I told you that beating cancer is not the end of the battle? For many, surviving cancer may actually mark the beginning of a new deadly health challenge, heart failure. Representing a quarter of all new cancer diagnoses among Canadian women, breast cancer remains the most common cancer faced by women to date. 
despite tremendous improvements in the overall detection and management of breast cancer, collateral heart damage remains a significant and scary consequence. Symptoms of this heart failure can be debilitating, often leaving individuals with life-altering, long-lasting side effects. Current medical practice involves prescribing multiple heart failure medications after damage is done, which unfortunately for many is too late. Additionally, many heart failure medications lower blood pressure, heightening feelings of lightheadedness. The idea of taking yet another pill to prevent heart damage is nauseating for many cancer patients. I believe we have a duty to prevent cancer patients today from becoming cardiac patients tomorrow. Up to 30% of women with breast cancer choose to consume alternative supplements, including flaxseed. Strikingly, recent research has demonstrated that flaxseed is able to not only enhance the cancer-killing capabilities of chemotherapy, but protect the heart from its damage. This has led to my study, which hopes to compare whether flaxseed, grown and harvested right here in Manitoba, will work comparably to these heart-saving medications at protecting the hearts of women with breast cancer. Using an of chemotherapy-induced heart damage, we have shown that consumption of flaxseed is as effective as conventional heart failure medication at protecting the heart from chemotherapy. In our six-week study, consumption of flaxseed was able to match heart failure medication in its performance by not only protecting the heart's ability to pump, but blocking the damage that chemotherapy may cause. Essentially, flaxseed was able to keep those heart cells healthy during and after chemotherapy. And as many of you know, this is vitally important because the heart is typically not able to regenerate its cells upon injury. The results from this exciting basic science study are being translated into the CAMFLAX clinical trial, investigating the use of flax milk in protecting the hearts of women with breast cancer. While unfortunately, I do not have a cure to either cancer or cardiovascular disease, I believe Hippocrates said it best. Let's let food be thy medicine. Imagine, flaxseed, the new prescription cardiologists will be writing to protect the hearts of women with breast cancer. Thank you. Cameron, thank you so very much. A very enlightening presentation. I've been saying to my colleagues today here at 680 CJOB and, and Global about the competition, and they're so excited because um, uh, this is reflecting what the best and brightest of our Manitobans are doing right now. Thank you again, Cameron, for starting us off this Wednesday evening. This is the three minute thesis competition and our next finalist is Janelle Francis. Her thesis title is the identification of human um, enteric viruses present in urban water bodies of Manitoba. Have you ever swam in the Red or Assiniboine River? I surely haven't, and I'm sure many of us may rather go to a beach. So why do we find beaches safer to swim in than rivers? Well, here's why. When liquid waste leaves our home, it goes into large sanitary sewer pipes that transport the wastewater to sewage plants for treatment. The purified wastewater is discharged as pure effluents into the Red and Assiniboine River that drains into Lake Winnipeg. Now UV light is used by sewage plants to screen and remove fecal bacteria from our wastewater. But here's the major problem with that. None of the current water quality assessments protect against viruses, which means Viruses are present in our pure effluents at the time of discharge. This is because fecal bacteria is the current gold standard of aquatic health for assessing the microbial quality of our wastewater. Bacteria indicator tests are used worldwide despite the fact that they correlate poorly with the presence of other types of microbes such as viruses. Now here's the second problem. Since Manitoban waterways are in fact all interconnected, fecal contamination of either river has an impact on Lake Winnipeg as well. There are many First Nation communities 
situated along the shores of Lake Winnipeg that rely on it for domestic and recreational use. So fecal contamination of our surface waters in general presents a huge public health issue. As you can see, there's a demand for reform. And this is where my thesis comes in. My thesis is based upon the hypothesis that viruses are better indicators of aquatic health compared to current gold standards. Now you're probably wondering why. Why are viruses better? Well, viruses are in fact more pathogenic than bacteria because they are prone to rapid replication with high mutation rates. So I will quantify viruses from the Red and Assiniboine River to establish baseline viral community structures that can be used to identify novel viral markers of fecal contamination. Development of these viral markers may lead to enhanced wastewater purification standards that will improve the quality of our wastewater discharged into rivers. Thank you. Janelle, thank you so very much. Fascinating. And like I said, we're all learning a lot tonight about some of the excellent research that is going on. Remember to use our event hashtags, 3MT, U Manitoba, and capitalized UM Research. Our next finalist, his thesis is Nationalism and Integration Policy, a Comparative Cross-National Examination. And then as you can see, there's very different subject areas. This is Quene Apa. When we picture what is uniquely Canadian, we visualize sprawling natural beauty, pond hockey, and Canadian geese. We recognize these stereotypes as being Canadian because we connect with them. These stereotypes are an important part of feeling like we belong. Nationalism is the aggressive structural belief that one group is superior over another. Nationalism becomes a vehicle to promote racism, sexism, xenophobia, and worse for the sake of group dominance. And as we witness with the insurrection of the US Capitol, nationalism can be explosively violent. The core of nationalism is the shared national identity. And when individuals don't fit into the outlined racial, gender, or sexual identity, they are forcibly pushed out. Individuals can be pushed out socially through acts of discrimination, but they can also be pushed out structurally through policy. And when individuals are pushed out, they no longer belong. Belonging is a basic fundamental human need. As we've experienced with the COVID-19 pandemic, when we're unable to belong to our groups, our quality of life is heavily impacted. To belong is to be a valued member of society. Belonging gives us access to social and institutional spaces. And it's more difficult to foster a sense of belonging when you're faced with heightened instances of discrimination, as is present in nationalism. Upon first glance, it's hard to see how nationalism influences a country's immigration policy. And that's why my research conducts a cross-national comparative analysis into Canada, Hungary, and Sweden. I analyze country documents to assess how nationalism influenced the immigration policy of these countries. And what I found is that there's elements of nationalism in each country, with elements being stronger in more conservative nations. The chart on the left shows that Canada and Sweden, liberal and social democratic countries, view immigrants as a strength in comparison to Hungary, a more conservative nation. The chart on the right shows that more economically advanced nations, again, Canada and Sweden, are in support of high-skilled immigration. You'll notice Hungary is not on this list. These countries, while not perfect, do a more favorable job of minimizing national influence on their immigration policies. Immigration policies in these countries tend to foster a stronger sense of belonging. My research provides recommendations to enhance immigration policies so that belonging can be a fully integrated principle. Belonging builds stronger societies and it builds stronger economies. When we think of Canada, we should visualize sprawling natural beauty, all types of seasons, and a population that doesn't just feel they belong, they know they do. Thank you. I mean, thank you so very much. Very interesting. Uh, this is 
the three minute thesis, 3MT, Richard Cluche with you this Wednesday evening. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, three down, nine to go. And our next finalist is Nolan Delon. The thesis title is Assessment of Circular Ribonucleic Acid Expression Profiles in Biofluids for the Prognosis and Diagnosis of Congenial Anomalies. Say that quickly. After months of trying, you and your partner are overwhelmed with joy when you finally find out you're going to have a baby. At your first ultrasound, you're excited to see your baby for the first time. However, excitement quickly turns to dread when the doctor says they think something could be wrong. Unable to give you any definitive answers, they send you home with a referral for an appointment that is weeks away. These weeks feel like years and the anxiety is unbearable. You feel helpless knowing that your baby may be sick and there's nothing you can do but wait. After what feels like an eternity, you're finally able to speak to the specialist, but their answers confirm your worst fears. Your baby's lungs are underdeveloped and their abdominal organs have herniated into their chest through a hole in the diaphragm. If they survive until birth, they'll undergo invasive surgery and be placed on life support. Your baby has congenital diaphragmatic hernia or CDH and there's more than a 30% chance that they're going to die before you can hold them for the first time. And by the end of today, 15 new families just like yours will face the harsh reality that their baby with CDH will die all because we didn't know until it was too late. I am going to change that. What if your doctor could put your worries at ease or prepare you for the worst with a more accurate test? The answer is in circular RNAs. We've discovered that an abundance or deficiency of these small ring-like structures can identify CDH several months before birth. They can also predict if a baby with CDH would benefit from prenatal therapy by helping their lungs grow and giving them a better chance at a normal life. I aim to explore the use of circular RNAs to monitor and diagnose underdeveloped lungs in the fetus. Bayscope is a simple and reliable technique used in the lab to detect circular RNAs in tissues. Recently, we've adapted Bayscope to detect circular RNAs in amniotic fluid, bringing circular RNA detection from the lab to the clinic with a simple three-step process as I've outlined on my slide. Starting to the left, the first step is to take a small sample of amniotic fluid during pregnancy. Second, circular RNAs that are associated with the birth defect are isolated and detected with a highly specific visible marker. And lastly, levels of circular RNAs are measured, allowing for the diagnosis of any potential developmental problems. My goal is to confirm the differences in circular RNA levels between the amniotic fluid of healthy babies and CDH babies with our new liquid biopsy, but this is just the beginning. These first steps will allow us to branch out into point-of-care diagnostics without the need for expensive, highly specialized equipment, making this effective tool accessible to families all around the world. An unreliable diagnosis used to mean an all too early end to a new family and the life of their child. But with circular RNA diagnostics, I plan to bring new beginnings in this circle of life. Thank you so very much, Nolan. Appreciate that very much. And like I said, with this and the other three, we're learning so much this evening. And we know our future is in good hands, isn't it? Our next finalist is Nusheen. Ahmadpur. The thesis title, Decoding the True Language of the Brain. Did you know that people die from depression? Every 40 seconds, someone somewhere in the world take their own lives. 90% of them suffer from a brain disorder, mostly depression. We might think that this is weak and selfish of them, and that brain disorder sufferers should be grateful for living in the right time and not some 50 years ago when there was nothing to be done for them. Yet, our treatments for brain disorders are far from good. You cycle through medications as long as it takes to find the right one. You deal with innumerable side effects. You emerge and relapse and emerge and finally realize that you have to be on medication forever. So they are not weak or selfish. We failed to fix what makes them think they don't deserve to live. And this is largely because for so long, we underestimated the complexity of our brains. What does this mean? The brain is composed of 100 billion neurons, cells that transmit information at 100 trillion connection spots called synapses 
enabling us to be. Fascinating, right? What's more fascinating is that this is only 10% of the brain. 90% of the brain is composed of glia, non-neuronal cells that since the 19th century were taken out of context, considered as lifeless glue holding neurons together. But times changed, and only in the last 20 years, scientists identified subtypes of glia and assigned essential functions to each. They discovered that a subtype of glia, astrocytes, have bidirectional communications with neurons at synapses. They even found the imprint of astrocyte dysfunction in many brain disorders, including depression. Now, we just need to decode the language of astrocyte neuron communication to understand how the brain truly works so that further down the road, we can realize how things go wrong in brain disorders. One study in this regard is my thesis. I hypothesize that a specific receptor, a protein on the astrocyte that acts as a pulse box, capturing the message coming to the cell is necessary for astrocyte neuron communication. So I took away this specific receptor from the astrocytes of the mouse's brain and watched these astrocytes and their neurons deal with it. I saw that the activity of these astrocytes and their nearby neurons is significantly lower compared to normal astrocytes and their nearby neurons. So I proved that the absence of this specific receptor causes interruptions in the communications at the synapse, and I decoded a small part of astrocyte neural language. Now, this is not the immediate cure to brain disorders, but I believe progress towards understanding brain disorders will not happen if we underestimate the surreal complexity of our brains. Thank you. Nusheen, thank you so very much. Again, we encourage you to tell people about the event. Our hashtags are 3MT at U Manitoba and UM Research. Our next finalist is Shusisti Mundalda, or my apologies, Mundalda, uh, safe storage for flaxseed. I bet we all have that one rough day at work when you just want to get back home, relax, and eat something. Let's say some cheese with wine. Now imagine that you reach home and find this cheese left on the counter with some greenish mold on it. It suddenly struck to you that you forgot to put the cheese in the refrigerator and now it has started to spoil within a few hours. Bad, isn't it? Now let's replace this spoiled cheese with tons and tons of spoiled grains. That is the life of a farmer who works hard to produce huge amounts of grain that could all potentially go waste just because of improper storage. Finding a solution to this problem brought me to Canada, where I began to study the most useful crop grown here. Yes, you might think, finally somebody's here to study canola, but no, I am here to study flaxseed. I have heard so many people talk about the growing demands of flax in both linen and paint industry, but there is more to this small miraculous oil seed. This seed is the future food. It holds high amounts of omega-3 fats, fiber, and protein that provide innumerable health benefits. Just what our fast living generation needs. Did you know Canada is the leading producer of flax, which is a result of a flax breeding program conducted in 1980s, after which huge profits are earned by exporting this flax to places like China and Europe. Now that is a double whammy. Imagine traveling from 15 degrees Celsius all the way to 35 degrees Celsius in the sea with high humidity for 48 hours, perfect for fungal growth. Moreover, this future food is a bit difficult to deal with. It has certain gums on its surface that stick together to form a huge clump of mass when they spoil. And the only way to remove it is by dismantling the entire grain bin structure. No wonder farm losses in Canada increases every year by 12%. Unfortunately, we barely have any information on the proper storage of flaxseed. My research focuses on developing storage guidelines by replicating environmental conditions in a lab setup and observing the degradation of flax over a certain period of time. These guidelines can be used by the farmers for drying and aeration operations, which will lead to efficient storage. This will not only mitigate the financial losses, but will also prevent the wastage of tons of grains. We battle every day between fulfilling our demand and sustaining the resources amid this climatic chaos. And in this steadily growing population, the only resource that is essential for our survival 
is food. And it's about time that we work towards its proper storage and preservation. Because sometimes prevention is not just the best, but the only cure. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Shristi. Uh, I guess that's that's two of our finalists now have had something to do with flax. I think I know what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow. Our next finalist is Veronica Copolero. Uh, the thesis title is Passive um, Acoustic Monitoring of Marine Mammals in the Canadian Arctic and the Implications of a Changing Arctic for Their Populations and Habitat Use. Imagine you're a whale swimming in the Arctic Ocean. The environment around you might seem remote and quiet, but nowadays, this is not the case anymore. We know that underwater, it is harder to see than to hear, and that sound can travel long distances. This is why marine mammals have evolved to use sound to explore their world, and they use it for many purposes, such as feeding, navigating, and communicating to each other. Now, what do you think might happen if during these activities, a large, loud ship passes by? I can give you a few options. They could try and compensate for this background noise by sounding louder, just like we do when speaking to a friend in the city center and traffic peaks up. Or they could get scared and stop vocalizing or even flee their favorite area. Or maybe with time, they could get used to the noise, but this could cost them more energy. If noise disrupts their key activities, marine mammals might stop reproducing, searching for food, and in the long run, even their survival could be at risk. With my research, I am trying to understand how marine mammals react to vessel disturbance and which are the factors that determine these different behaviors. To do this, I install underwater microphones in key areas of the Canadian Arctic where marine mammals go to feed, mate, and nurse their young. By listening to the recordings, I can recognize different species and study their natural vocalizations. Then, if vessel noise is present, I can determine whether marine mammals modify their vocalizations and behavior. This type of study is especially important in the Arctic, where climate change is causing sea ice to rapidly decrease. As a result, the Arctic is becoming more open to ship traffic in areas where marine mammals have been sheltered from many human activities so far. Hence, it is necessary that we understand what could happen to marine mammals in a noisier Arctic Ocean if we want to be ready and able to protect them. This is why I'm working for the government to help inform on marine mammal disturbance in areas of the Arctic where ship traffic is already increasing. My final goal is to communicate my findings to decision makers to support their efforts towards marine wildlife conservation. By providing data that can influence both ship traffic regulations and the creation of marine protected areas, I hope to contribute to restore a quieter Arctic Ocean for marine mammals in as many areas as possible. Thank you. Veronica, thank you so very much. Tomorrow, by the way, is Earth Day. You're watching the University of Manitoba 2021 3MT finals, three minute thesis. And our finalists are so also very good and it'd be very difficult for our judges to pick the top three our next finalist is dina uh dana rather al hatab uh the thesis title is the role of scleraxis in perivascular fibrosis cardiovascular diseases kill about 18 million people every year they are the leading cause of death worldwide in both men and women. Patients with cardiovascular diseases usually die from heart attack, stroke, heart failure, or even kidney failure. Similar to this gentleman in the picture who has high blood pressure, most of these diseases are related to vascular dysfunction, or what we call vascular stiffness. More scientific term, vascular fibrosis. So normally, our blood vessels would act as a mini pump or as a balloon. When they are filled with blood, they would expand. And then they would contract to push the blood forward to other organs. However, this is not the case if you got a stiff vessel. 
in step vessels, it's really hard for it to relax or contract normally. And this is because of the protein buildup on the vessel wall that would act as a mesh-like and will make the vessel wall more thick that would impair the blood flow going to the organs that need it. The protein buildup is represented similar to the bricks buildup on the wall, which make it more stiff. In a similar process, we found that there is an important protein called scleraxis that would trigger the protein buildup in the heart, making the heart more stiff. In a medical condition, we call it cardiac fibrosis. So now my project is to see the role of scleraxis in the protein buildup or in the stiffness of the blood vessels. If we imagine that the protein buildup is similar to the bricks on the wall and the scleraxis is the cement that is holding them together and helping them build up to become more stiff. Having a mouse model with high blood pressure and stiff vessels, if I genetically target the scleraxis or the cement from these stiff vessels, are we able to restore the function of these unhealthy stiff vessels to healthier ones? Are we able to target the scleraxis in the drug design for patients with high blood pressure? Are we able to rescue this gentleman in the picture and millions of others who die regularly from vascular related diseases? All of these questions I'm aiming to answer throughout my project. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dana. Appreciate that so very much. Our next finalist is Odile Quinn. The thesis title, Cannabis, a Potential Therapy for Breast Cancer. One in eight women are diagnosed in their lifetime by which disease? The answer is breast cancer, the number one cancer in women. So imagine someone in your life was diagnosed with breast cancer, a family, friend, or colleague. What do they do? Well, they get treatment right away. And luckily, science has come a long way to help these patients with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. But it's still not enough because breast cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women. So what can we do about it? Well, one option is that we can develop diagnostic tools to detect the cancer early. Detecting the cancer early usually results in better health outcomes for the patients. But what about your loved one who is already diagnosed and has exhausted all of their treatment options? Well, the other option is to simply find a new one. And one that I'm proposing is to look into cannabis as a viable therapy. Now, cannabis has been legalized in Canada since 2018. However, its use is heavily stigmatized and controversial, especially for medical purposes. However, cancer patients have actually long used cannabis to relieve themselves of any cancer-related symptoms that they might be experiencing, such as pain, nausea, and anxiety, just to name a few. But the question still remains, does cannabis have any anti-cancer properties? Well, based on my research, the answer is yes, it does. What has been determined is that the two main compounds that are found within the cannabis plant, THC and CBD, yield anti-cancer properties. Properties which include decreasing cell growth while increasing cell death. In other words, the cancer is being eliminated, which is great news. Now, going back to the two main compounds that I mentioned earlier, THC and CBD, these two compounds are actually found within a drug called Sativex, which has been approved by Health Canada and is actually already on the market. Now, Sativex was originally developed for another debilitating disease, multiple sclerosis. However, based on our research, it can definitely be used for breast cancer as well. Now, to finally answer your number one burning question at the moment, do I use cannabis? Well, sorry to be a little anticlimactic, but no, I don't personally use or possess any cannabis. 
But what I do possess, however, is the strong belief that it is vital for us to study cannabis because we're always looking for new treatment options and not just for breast cancer, but for other cancers and other diseases as well. So why not marijuana? Thank you very much. Well, Yale, yeah, thank you so very much. Our next finalist is Vimala Bharati SK. The thesis title is Understanding the Insect Movement Pattern Inside a Grain Bin. When you hear the term insects, what is your first thought? Is it disgusting, exciting, or cute? Let me be more specific. How about sharing your food with insects? My guess is the answer would be a strict no for most of you, including the woman in the picture. This woman worked hard to produce the food grain and stored it to feed her family. These tiny insect pests get into the stored grain and start feeding and live inside. As a result of the infestation, the woman and her family had to go to bed hungry every single night. In fact, one in nine people in the world are going to bed hungry each night. Contrarily, these tiny insects enjoy the food and cause loss of more than 25% of the food grain produced in the world. As an engineer from an agricultural family, I aspire to reduce this loss by playing a game called Guardians of the Grains. The mission of this game is to eradicate the bad guys, in our case, insect pests. Just like any other video game, first, we need to understand where the bad guys are present and how they move inside the grain. But identifying these small insects inside a big grain bin is like looking for a needle in a haystack. That's where my research comes into play. In level one of the game, I have designed a three-dimensional lab scale setup and studied the movement of insects inside the grain at various grain temperatures and moisture contents in the lab. In level two, I'm developing a mathematical model to identify the pattern of their distribution using the data from level one. But how can we be sure if this model from a lab experiment is applicable for the big bin where hundreds of tons of grain is stored? That's why in level three, I am performing an actual bin experiment with 300 tons of wheat grain. These data can be used to validate not only my model, but also various other stored grain models that are developed worldwide. And remember, this is a team game in which my research, which helps in understanding the behavioral pattern of insects, can be used as a checkpoint in developing a proper stored grain management protocol and move forward to achieve the goal of protecting the grains. Even today, hunger is one of the biggest threats to mankind, and it's about to get worse. The consequences of climate change, such as unpredictable weather patterns and flooding, significantly reduce the agricultural yield. Considering these factors, along with the rise in global population, researchers like the one I'm doing is crucial to move towards a hunger-free world. A kernel of grain protected is a kernel of grain produced. Thank you. Jamila, thank you so very much. Fascinating. This and all our finalists, it's um, food for thought, isn't it? Our next finalist in the three-minute thesis competition here at the University of Manitoba is Chris Voth. And the thesis title for Chris is Shining a Light on the Unseen Athletes. Sport has always inspired our society and has the amazing ability to have an impact off the field, such as bringing together fighting nations like in the World War I Christmas True Soccer game, or Jackie Robinson who broke the color barrier, Venus Williams who ended the gender pay gap in tennis, starting the conversation for our society, or most recently Colin Kaepernick, who sacrificed his career by taking a knee to raise awareness of police brutality. I'm hoping to start a new movement but this time with athletes who, until now, were competing in the dark. Growing up, there weren't any openly gay athletes competing, so I thought I was also going to have to wait until retirement. But I wanted to be a, a role model for aspiring athletes, so I started my professional career by coming out as Canada's first active openly gay national team athlete. There is a noticeable absence of gay team sport athletes in North America. We have the top baseball, hockey, basketball, and football leagues in the world, but no currently out athletes. The NHL hasn't even had an athlete come out after their career. The same pattern is also seen at the Olympics, showing that it's not just a North American issue, it's a sport issue. 
The current literature says that we are past homo hysteria and now into inclusion, but based on the number of out athletes, there's still work to be done. I lost countless contracts for being gay, with many teams studying that as the reason for not hiring me or not honoring our signed contracts. But what are they so afraid of? Am I an anomaly or is this the norm? Until now, it wasn't possible to find these athletes because there hadn't been someone on the inside, giving me the unique ability to shine a light on their stories. All the previous research has focused mainly on American high school or college and university athletes, with only a handful being professional and only a couple of those being on team sports. There's so much to explore with these in-depth one-on-one interviews with athletes from around the world competing in different sports. Without the fear of being outed, these athletes will be able to share their sacred stories including how they're able to navigate into the professional realm and suggestions for aspiring athletes to do the same. These suggestions could be for teammates, coaches, fans, entire sport organizations, or even go back as far as the physical education classes. A lot of research suggests that these phys ed classes are a time when athletes determine that sport is not a welcoming place for them. The University of Manitoba has mandated a deeper dive into inclusion to which this will be an important part. The possibilities of this research are endless. The same system that's holding back gay team sport athletes is also the driver behind racism, sexism, transphobia, and more. To make sport inclusive, we have to ask people who have navigated through it and know it best. By highlighting their experiences, I hope to change the sport culture and like those athletes before, see societal change follow. That's how I'm going to shine a light on the unseen athletes. Thank you. Chris, thank you so very much. We've come far, but we have a far way to go. Our next and final presenter is Sanu Varghese. The thesis panel, uh, the thesis title here is Exercise to Prevent Anthracycline Based Cardio Toxicity. By the end of my three minute talk today, another 12 women across the globe will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Thankfully, due to the many advancements in anti-cancer agents, breast cancer is no longer the death sentence it once used to be. However, as more women are surviving their cancer, we're starting to see a more sinister side of these anti-cancer agents. Particularly, the work in our lab has shown that about one in four women who take these anti-cancer agents will develop injury to their heart. What this ultimately means is that if the cancer doesn't kill them, heart disease down the road will. This raises a very important question. Is there a way to protect the hearts of these women, but also keep these drugs within their treatment plan? Yes, enter aerobic exercise. Numerous studies have shown that exercising during the course of cancer therapy can protect the hearts of these women. So, Great, problem solved, right? Unfortunately not. While we know that this exercise is beneficial for these women, actually getting them to follow through with an exercise program, it's a whole another challenge. And can we blame them? Most of the exercise programs currently in place are hospital-based. And for women who already have to come to the hospital multiple times a week, they don't want to come back to exercise. Additionally, with the COVID-19 pandemic, this hesitancy to come to the hospital has only increased. So our research team here at the University of Manitoba designed a state-of-the-art, personalized, home-based aerobic exercise program. And compared to the hospital-based counterparts, our program provides three additional benefits. Firstly, it is cost-efficient as it doesn't require any additional equipment. Two, through the use of polar heart rate watches, our women are able to exercise according to their own schedules. And thirdly, perhaps most importantly, all of this can be done within the comfort of their own home. And having run this study for one year, our results are astonishing. Compared to the hospital-based programs, which only have a compliance of 40 to 50%, our home-based exercise program was followed 94% of the time. Additionally, compared to the group that did not exercise, by taking pictures of the heart, we're able to see that our woman who exercised was able to maintain a healthier heart during the course of their cancer therapy, meaning we can almost guarantee that they don't need to see a cardiologist in the future. 
So yes, by the end of my talk today, 12 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. But this paradigm shift in bringing exercise to the home will ensure that these women don't also become tomorrow's cardiac patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sano. Wow, what an incredible group. Bravo to all of you. I can only imagine how hard it is to present in a room without uh, full of people, and I miss that so much. You'd love to have people cheering you on, but I know we're all cheering each and every one of our finalists on. I hope each and one of you know how impressive that you are. And thanks again to all of our challengers for such impressive presentations. I've learned a lot and I'm sure you have as well. And thank you, all of us watching in our audience for your support and your enthusiasm. The judging panel will now move to your secure breakout room for your deliberations. Now, while they are deliberating, you've got an important job to do here. It's time for you at home to vote for the People's Choice Award. Here's how you can do it. On your phone or on your computer, please go to the following address, menti.com, capital M-E-N-T-I dot com, M-E-N-T-I dot com. Um, I'll talk you through it here. Now, once you get to the web page, go to menti.com. Once you get to the web page, please enter this code. It's on your screen, but I will tell you it's 94 two nine three three two and you'll see a list of all the competitors names to choose from select your favorite click submit and that's it so please go to that website uh, menti.com in your browser that uh, code is nine four two nine three three two and select your favorite click submit and that's it you have uh, seven minutes now the people's vote choice is happening live this is all happening while the judges are deliberating, so it's important you go there right now and vote quickly. Now, there is a slideshow recap of all the finalists will be presented on the screen during the People's Choice live vote. You have seven minutes, so go now. Go vote now. Uh, it's your favorite. Menti.com, 9429-332. After the voting has closed, we'll hear a very short musical performance.
thank you everyone for voting. Really appreciate you doing that. It's so very important that um, that gets done and that you all have your say. I'd like now to introduce our entertainment for the evening. Please welcome the Elizabeth Sadler Trio. Elizabeth on vocals, um, Ilya Oschuk on bass, Connor Dara on piano. All three are talented musicians with the Desatel Faculty of Music alumni who recorded this performance as part of the Rady JCC Music in Mavens concert series produced by Carla uh, Burbrayer, which featured music of the 60s and 70s. It's the time of the season when love runs high. It's the time, give it to me easy. And let me try with pleasured hands to take it to the sun to promise lands to show you. Rich like me, has she taken any time to show?
Thank you very much. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. Nice. Thank you so very much. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Richard Kluche from 680 CJOB and Global. I'm here at the 30th floor at Portage in Maine, and there's a beautiful, beautiful sun in the West India State. And we, everybody, we thank our judges. On a personal note, I would like to thank all our competitors. Thank you for watching and being with us and our wonderful technical and production team at the University of Manitoba. Well, I'm sure you're as anxious to hear them as I am. Let's get now to the results. Um, of 
course, this is a very difficult judge uh, job for our judges. Uh, we want to thank them for being with us and taking the time. And it's obviously a, a very difficult job choosing a winner among these very impressive competitors. But let's bring in uh, Dr. Main to present our finalists. Thank you, Richard. I'm delighted to be able to present the awards tonight for the ninth annual 3MT competition. All of our graduate students did a fantastic job presenting their research so concisely this evening, and I just want to say how proud I am of all of the competitors. Now, here are the results that we have all been waiting for this evening. So first, we will present the People's Choice Award, which is selected from votes from tonight's virtual audience. The winner for tonight as the People's Choice Award is Sanu Varghese. Wow, thank you. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, thanks to my supervisor, Dr. Devinder Jassel, Dr. Marshall Peets, as well as uh, all the research community at St. Boniface Research Center, Cancer Care Manitoba, and my family and friends who are watching who helped vote me in and uh, received this People's Choice. So thank you so much. Well done. And the third place winner is Sristi Munhada. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd really like to thank University of Manitoba for providing us a platform. And I would love to thank my supervisors, Dr. Palival and Dr. Kimbe, without whose guidance I wouldn't have been here. And last but not the least, thank you so much, my family and friends. Moving on to second place, which is the U of M Retirees Association Prize. This goes to Dana Ertahab. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to receive this award and thank you for my family, my friend, my supervisor, Dr. Mike Schubert, my uh, Dr. Jeff Weigel for helping me as well and everyone else. And thank you for, thank you for this nice competition. Thank you. And our final prize this evening is named in honor of the late Dr. Archie McNichol. He was an associate dean in the Faculty of Graduate Studies and he was an enthusiastic supporter of our 3MT competition. So the Dr. Archie McNichol prize for first place goes to Nolan De Leon. Hi everybody, um, I am overwhelmed and overjoyed. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all the competitors, your research was amazing. Um, and I want to say a special thanks to my lab, the Miracle Lab, my supervisor, Dr. Richard Kaiser, and the, the team that's been supporting me, Dr. Andrew C., and of course, my family, friends, and my fiance, Kayla Adwood. Thank you so much um, for your support, everybody. So for all of those who are still watching, let's give a virtual round of applause to all of our winners and all of the competitors for their great work tonight. I'd like to just extend my thanks again to our judges from this evening, our MC, all of the technical support that we've had, as well as all of you who are here in our audience for being here tonight in support of our graduate students at the University of Manitoba. And I hope all of you will tune in on May 13th, which will be the Western Canada Regional 3MT competition. So you can cheer on Nolan as he competes. More details can be found at umanitoba.ca slash 3MT. Thank you to everyone and have a great evening.